Being, now let's move to needle exchange, okay? You want to talk about needle exchange. The idea, let's take some of the arguments. I'm going to move away from what I've been saying, and I'm going to talk about some of the arguments against it and draw out some of the issues here. You know, one obvious and fair, uh, a seemingly fair argument is that it promotes drug use. Okay? Number one, let's go back to the first part of my talk. It absolutely does not promote drug use and it creates positive outcomes for life, for disease, and for social situations. And I'm going to give you a few uh, things to think about here. If I'm a severe heroin addict and I've gotten to the point where I need needles, do you actually think on the day that I choose to quit heroin, I'm going to actually continue to use intravenous heroin because there's a needle exchange program? Just think about that from the individual level. The very thought is insane that it promotes substance abuse. It just is purely a, a insanity. Normal people don't go to a needle exchange program. That is a place of desperation. And to think that it promotes intravenous drug use is not only insane from rational thinking perspective and from common sense perspective, the data shows clearly the opposite of what this is. What is a needle exchange place? It is a common sense, compassionate, thoughtful, humane approach to deal with the disease of our fathers, of our brothers, of our children, of our neighbors, of ourselves. It is an opportunity to make human contact and create a safe environment where you can do education for disease uh, um, intervention. You can do secondary educations uh, with the females in terms of you know uh, all of the trauma that they suffer in the streets and it comes with addiction and that's a whole nother topic which I'd like to discuss uh, females in addiction you can have interventions for hepatitis C uh, you can have an opportunity to divert these human beings and the time does come when they want such a thing into the appropriate opportunity for care and what you're doing while they're getting to that place is making sure they stay alive. There is no treatment for a dead addict. There's no hope if we continuously to create, it, it continuously allow them to create their own demise. And if you think it's their fault and their choice, I heard something interesting today. I've never met an addict once they get to that stage of addiction where they tell you it's fun and they love doing this and they enjoy all the family and friends they've lost and they enjoy the number of overdoses they've had, which by the way is why we should have decriminalization and we should have an opportunity where they can shoot up in a safe place. That's very controversial, but I 100% believe that and the data covers it. Going back to what I'm saying. Uh, I've never met an addict that tells you they enjoy what they're doing. They're at a stage when they've come to some place like a needle exchange. This is what they want to do. They love the fact that they've gotten HIV, hepatitis C. They love the fact that at hospitals they're treated like criminals. They love the fact that they, they are looked at, looked at as the marginalized leopards of our social uh, environment. They love the fact that they're constantly in and out of the criminal system and they're treated like complete garbage. I've never met an addict doing that. So why not create an opportunity for compassion, for care, for safety, for disease prevention? and eventually for intervention and cure. Let me give you one example. This is not even controversial, which really kind of blows my mind. How do these things become controversial in the 21st century in the United States of America where there's public debates about it? Methadone clinics decrease crime, spread of disease, social functionability scales, and recovery. 
crime, spread of HIV, social function functionality, I'm sorry, and eventually recovery. Why would we not do something like that? This disease is the disease. And I don't know any drug addict, once they're at that stage, that tells you they love this and this is what they've always wanted in their life. And if you think otherwise, pull one aside and have a long conversation about them. Harm reduction is what we did with tobacco. Education is it was sort of a harm reduction approach, okay? And we educated everyone about tobacco and we got them to uh, stop uh, smoking. And, and, and just so you know, these public health approaches do work and smoking went down significantly, lung cancer went down significantly, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna cl close this off and this is a topic that there's so much to discuss and uh, there's a couple of other uh, thing I, I do want to discuss here. I'm going to refer you to a study which I haven't read in years. It's over 100 pages long, and uh, I haven't reviewed it re lately. <clears throat> it was by the RAND Corporation. Many of you might know what that is. R-A-N-D. R as in Randy, A-N-D. RAND Corporation. I believe <clears throat> the study was co-authored by the U.S. military. If I recall correctly, it was in uh, correctly, it was 1993 and 1994. This was right after or right around the time where we were coming off of the cocaine epidemic, so-called cocaine epidemic at that time. And the questions were very simple and, and ran those pretty robust studies. The question was simple. What is the most effective way and the cheapest way to get rid of the cocaine issue and to stop getting people to stop doing cocaine. What is the most effective way and the cheapest way to, to approach the cocaine epidemic and get people help? I don't use the word cure. And the study had four different what they call arms. This is very interesting. Please follow with me. What is the most effective way to address the cocaine issue? At the same time, what is the most cheapest way to be able to do this for the largest number of people? The study had four different parts of it, and uh, I won't go into the technical terms used, but essentially on one extreme of this arm, uh, and again, it's been many years since I read the study, it's 100 pages long, was actually the worst thing you can possibly do <clears throat> is punishment and incarceration. Okay, Punishment incarceration, and crop decimation. That, that means intervening from the source of the drugs, which is, you know, keep that in mind. Intervening on the source of the drugs. Uh, that means going after the drug dealers. Uh, in that time, uh, the, this meant crop decimation. And also keep in mind, crop decimation is, was a kind of a code term when you actually approach destroying the coca uh, crops in places like Colombia, well, I'm going to get to that in one second. The other most use, uh, on the other side of the study, it showed that the cheapest and most effective way was intervention and treatment uh, and education. Okay, it was something like that. That was the most effective and cheapest way to approach the cocaine epidemic. And the worst way to approach it in terms of what it cost the social destruction and actually curing was incarceration, law enforcement intervention, and attacking the supply source, which meant basically going after drug dealers and crop decimation, which was what it was. This was in the early 90s. During that time and soon after, the United States foreign policy turned out to be and domestic policy. What did it turn out to be after this large study? Incarceration, harsher laws, okay? No treatment money spent, and intervention at the supply source by, by what was called going after the crops, and you know, uh, harsher sentencing laws. There's more interesting pieces to this. Crop decimation in Colombia is not going after and destroying the coca crops. After the United States foreign policy went after this 
particular policy as an approach to the cocaine crisis, what crop decimation was, it actually destroyed the fields, the farming fields for those coca farmers. And we had the largest displaced, marginalized population in the world, which was led by Sudan until that time. They all fell from farming into the main cities of Colombia. Okay? And what the crop decimation did is it destroyed the farming and eventually American companies went over there and took uh, over a lot of land and you know we had the banana republic thing. Now take what I just said you know, the harm reduction approach would have been much more efficacious. And uh, think about tobacco. Tobacco causes more harm across the planet in terms of death, destruction, and societal costs. It's one of the number one on the World Health Organization uh, than cocaine by magnitudes. Imagine uh, today, because if you went to mainland China, the amount of lung cancer and death and destruction secondary to tobacco is out of this world. Now imagine if the Chinese said, you know what? Americans are selling us the tobacco. Let's do exactly what they did in Colombia. Let's take some B-52 bombers, go to North and South Carolina or wherever these, Virginia, where these tobacco crops are grown and let's bomb the living crap out of it. Isn't that insane? And uh, Noam Chomsky, for those of you who know who once said it, is that if Martians were looking at us and our approach to drug policy in this country, they would actually think we're actually either demonic or absolutely insane. Harm reduction works. It is the humane, humanitarian, common sense approach with more scientific data and evidence than I can even discuss here. And there is an insanity why we don't do it, which I can't understand. Well, I do understand. Please click on the video on the link to the left if you like what we're talking about. Uh, there's other videos uh, regarding substance abuse. I hope to do a lot more on harm reduction. It's a, a topic that's near and dear to me. And please, below, leave any comments, any questions. I hope to generate a discussion regarding this topic so we can uh, talk about it more in the future. Thank you very much.